Hello YouTube, this is Skip. Coming to you live. Shout out to Real House of Aquatic Kennels. I know you haven't seen this guy in a while. Big Gray Digger. Now, I'm making this video because I want to share a few fish facts with you guys. Over the winter months, this past winter, I discovered that Big Grave Digger has some unique traits and qualities that I have not seen in other cichlids. And that is, he has the ability to generate his own heat source, his own cool body temperature above five, almost 10 degrees, the water temperature of his environment. And what that means is he can warm his blood cells at the very least five degrees above his surrounding temperatures, which is very unique among cichlids and fish in general because most fish we consider vertebrates are cold-blooded animals. They are unable to generate heat whatsoever. That's why you need heaters in their aquariums. You know, you, I know some of you guys may have experienced this before when the heater broke or maybe somehow they got unplugged or the power went out and your fish was sluggish because the water temperature dropped below 70. Uh, your fish would not eat. They can't process food. They're just like uh, other uh, vertebrates, like reptiles. You know you have to have heap, heap rocks or stones for lizards and snakes so that they can digest their food. Well, fish, especially cichlids, tropical cichlids need a heat source as well to digest their food and process the enzymes in their digestive system. But what I found unique about black nasty hadiensis is they have the ability to create heat all by themselves. And what I found is, and this is this my third, the black nasty with that huge paint brush like tail has the same ability with that muscular tail that great white sharks have. I don't know if you guys know, but great white sharks always migrate from warm climates to cooler climates throughout the year and they can heat their body as well 13 degrees above the surrounding water temperatures and they do it with their tail their muscular tail the muscles in their tails contract and it creates a heat vortex that warm their blood cells I can't get too technical with it and I can't go into the complete science of it but that's it in a nutshell and the same go for this fish here the black nasty hadiensis. That's why it's a very unique fish. That's why it's one of my favorite fish. Let's check out a younger one. I have about seven inches. Check this guy out. He's about seven. No, I'm pushing probably about eight inches now. He has a nice, huge tail, a smaller paintbrush than Big Grave Digger. Grave Digger pushing over 16 inches. He's almost 18 inches now. But this guy has the same unique capability. I noticed that when the heat went out in this tank, the heater actually burst. It was an old heater in this tank. He did just fine as well under low temperatures. So I figure it may be a unique trait with this particular cichlid species. Let's go back to Grave Digger and see what they eat for us. Now I already fed Grave Digger, but let's, let's feed him one more time. I don't feed him that much. Do a little feed so you guys can see him eat. That, that's gone. And one, one scoop. Big Grave Digger is awesome. He's an awesome specimen. And like I said, I, I made videos this past winter showing him eating and matter of fact the tank 
temperature was like 65, one, one time it was 63 degrees in, in one video and he was still eating. Most cichlids wouldn't eat in low temperatures like that. Like this guy here, Big Eagle. You wouldn't catch him eating in low temperatures. The water has to be over 70 degrees in order for him to even think about going up to the top and, and grabbing some food. Let's see what he do. Yeah. Big Eagle. So, we, I come to the conclusion that this species here can generate its own heat, can warm its blood cells. Just like great white sharks, just like some eels and catfish, electric catfish, they use the electrical current to um, warm their bodies up. You also have a fish that was discovered that scientists say is actually the first warm-blooded fish ever discovered. And it, it stays in, it lives in the ocean in deep waters. It's called a moonfish or scientific name, the Opa. The name is on the screen right here, O-P-A-H. And it's supposed to be the first discovered warm-blooded, warm-blooded fish. Can you believe that? We also have some fish that are very unique as well. The ice fish or the antifreeze fish. This fish produces its own antifreeze. I mean, it can stay in freezing water with, with ice. A matter of fact, instead of me rambling on about it, take a look at this clip and then we'll come back to Grave Dick. Okay, YouTube, I didn't want to leave you guys hanging as far as a good glimpse or look at the Opa, the fish I mentioned that is the first newly discovered warm-blooded fish. The moonfish is the first fish that science discovered that is actually warm-blooded. So we're going to take a look at the Opa before we take a look at the antifreeze fish. And remember, when you tune in to Fish Law One channel, you're going to get the facts. You're going to get documentation like no other. I skip Fish Law One, separate the facts from the noise. Now let's check out the OPA. This OPA, also known as the Moonfish, was caught and released on a long line set off of the Channel Islands off of California. Scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have discovered the world's first warm-blooded fish, the OPA. Researchers discovered that the fish circulates heated blood through its body much like mammals and birds by constantly flapping its fins to move around. The fish is able to flap its wing-like pectoral fins to move forward, unlike most fish. Its pectoral muscle is insulated from the cold water by a layer of fat. Life Science reports that during the NOAA study of the fish, researchers attached temperature sensors and satellite tags to the OPA that allowed them to track its movements for eight months. The scientists monitored its body temperature as the fish dove down into cooler parts of the water. Scientists found that no matter what temperature the fish was at, it stayed five degrees cooler than the surrounding water. The researchers also found that the opus blood vessels in the gill tissue are arranged so that the vessels transporting cool blood from the gills are in contact with those that move the warm blood in the opposite direction. In the process, the incoming blood is warmed. The fish is able to increase the temperature of its heart, which helps the fish dive into deeper depths and remain there for long periods of time. Other fish such as tunas or lamid sharks have to return to the surface in between dives to keep warm. Opa mainly found in tropical and temperate waters. 
The fish are not caught in large numbers because they do not travel in schools, the NOAA says. Thrive in these waters, ice fish and other species, all members of a group called the notifenioids. Show just how different Antarctic notifenioids are from other fish. Husband and wife biologist Arthur DeVries, Christina Chang Dunkwood, Water is icy as the ocean outside their lab on Antarctica's McMurdo Sound. The temperature, minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, is so cold it's below the freezing point of fresh water and blood. So, as you can see, uh, this fish is doing fine at this freezing temperature in the midst of ice crystals. How these fish thrive in such cold waters baffled scientists until the 1960s when Art of Rees found that Antarctic fish had invented something that protects them from freezing. Antifreeze. These fish have a certain protein, and what it does is bind to the ice crystal in the fish, and by binding to So, only one group of fish in the Southern Ocean, the notifenioids, ice fish belong to them, have antifreeze. So it's an invention unique to this group, and that's allowed those fish to invade a space that other fish couldn't live in. And these are nutrient-rich waters full of lots of food. So these fish are thriving now where other fish couldn't thrive. Antifreeze proteins give notifenioids a clear edge where they live. But their existence poses an evolutionary mystery. When and how was antifreeze invented? The waters around Antarctica were once a temperate 10 degrees Celsius. But 34 million years ago, Drake Passage opened as Antarctica broke away from South America. Now a continuous current circled the new continent, isolating its surrounding waters. As a result, those waters chilled to minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. The notifenioids and antifreeze evolved in the last 34 million years. The traits are encoded by genes. Where did antifreeze genes come from? DeVries, Cheng, and Ling Bao Chen worked out part of the mystery in the 1990s by noticing that parts of the antifreeze gene, labeled in red, strongly resembled a different gene, that one gene gave rise to the other. The process began when the ancestral gene was accidentally duplicated. While one copy remained the same, the other accumulated mutations that eventually gave it a new function to make antifreeze proteins. The invention of antifreeze is a crystal clear example of inventing something new from something old, borrowing sort of the code of a pre-existing gene and then altering that to create a protein that has entirely new functions. And this story we see again and again in evolution, inventing something new from the old. Notifenioids invented antifreeze genes, but one family, the ice fish, went a step further and eliminated red blood cells and hemoglobin altogether. As for how that happened, the answer has also been preserved in DNA. And Bill Dietrich found it when he compared globin genes from ice fish and other fish. Globin genes encode the hemoglobin protein. So what do we see here? Well, as you go from left to right here, the normal red-blooded globin gene is shown in the sequence on the top. Down below, we have the sequence of the ice fish. And as we move from the left, you can see the dots these are exact matches in the sequence. Mm -hmm. However, at the arrow, we see we get virtually no match. This is essentially genetic gibberish. So it's broken right there. That is exactly right. At some point in history, a mutation wrecked this gene. And since hemoglobin was no longer necessary to ice fish, the mutation wasn't weeded out. This is the fossilized remnants of that gene. So if the gene has become useless, 
it will eventually be lost as these mutations pile up and just erase what used to be there. That is exactly right. So genes are born and genes die as species find ways to survive in an ever-changing world. This remarkable fish that Ditlif Rushted dredged up 80 years ago has taught us is that evolution doesn't always come up with the best solution imaginable. It just comes up with the best solution available. And that sometimes means getting rid of things that worked in our ancestors, as well as inventing new things like the antifreeze. And that record of changing habitats and changing lifestyles and changing genes is etched in the DNA record of life. How about that aquatic community? Now was that awesome or what? I mean, things like that just gets me excited. I love learning the science behind what's going on in our universe and in our world. Those two biologists are taking it to another level. And it, it was that was just incredible to me. So, in closing, I shared the fish facts with you. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Check me out as usual on Facebook, Twitter, Real House Cichlids. And with that said, this skip, you know the saying. <laughs>